camera turning, turning. All right. Uh, last class. Uh, very hard to believe. Uh, but these semesters, they fly by quicker and quicker, it seems, every year. Um, a little bit lighter attendance than today, huh? Okay. wonder why. It's not about the First Amendment. I don't know. Um, questions? Anything in your mind before we get started? No? Okay. All right. So please check in for your attendance. The, the attendance thing is running. Uh, our topic today um, is the Second Amendment. And this is sort of a hard topic to teach uh, because truly the Supreme Court has had one opinion on it. Um, Heller from 2008. Uh, there was another a decision, McDonald from 2010, uh, but that said very little about the Second Amendment. Um, it's for that reason that we actually gave you opinions from the lower courts as well as a bunch of Justice Thomas dissents <laughs> to give you some uh, guidance of where the Supreme Court is headed. Now, Heller was a very important case to me. Uh, when I was in law school, um, I actually worked as a research assistant for the lawyers who argued Heller. I had a very minor role. I, I basically blue booked a brief, right? So I don't want to pretend that any significant role, but I basically, you know, proofread and blue booked a brief. So no actual substantive input. I don't want to pretend. But this is a case I was very familiar with. Uh, also, one of my other law professors at the time uh, wrote an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief. Uh, based on 18th century grammar. Yes, John, grammar. And we actually had to read how 18th century grammar books worked and how people use phrases like prefatory clauses and oper Oh, wow, now people are coming in late, good. Uh, prefatory clauses and operative clauses. So I did a lot of work on this case. Uh, and I remember the day it was decided, it was uh, June of 2008, I actually read the entire thing cover to cover. Uh, the day it came out uh, and I was very excited. And then I soon realized like, wait a minute, there are a lot of open questions here, right? Um, you know, it didn't really talk about scrutiny very much and said a lot of things are okay, but not these things. And I was like, huh, what is this going to mean? And I say, well, you know, Josh, this is 2008. They'll figure it out later, right? In some case in the near future, the Supreme Court will take a case and they'll clarify all these open questions. So now we are a decade later four new justices. <laughs> Justice Scalia is, is, is in the great beyond. And we still do not have answers to um, the most basic questions. And in case after case, the Supreme Court has denied certiorari. They've denied review in case after case after case. Um, and this became frustrating after a while because the lower court started going every which way and issuing decisions that I think in many regards are inconsistent with Heller, especially the Seventh Circuit. Judge Eastbrook does not like Heller and he's very open about it. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, forget it. Um, you know, they sort of just say, okay, well, we'll just apply some sort of intermediate scrutiny. Okay, whatever. After a certain point, Justice Thomas started dissenting. And this is sort of a weird thing the Supreme Court does. Here's, a, here's how it works. On the Supreme Court, there are nine justices. To decide a case, you know you need five, right? A five to four decision. But to review a case that's a grant certiorari, you need four votes, right? You need four votes. But there's a calculus here, right? It's a hard choice to make. If there are four votes to grant certiorari, but the justices think there might be five votes to uphold the lower court decision, then it might not be a good way of using your votes. In other words, why would the four people who want to expand Second Amendment rights take a case if they know they're going to lose? Understand? So our question is always, who's the, who is the squish, right? Which of the people in Heller would be willing to affirm the Ninth Circuit? Was it Justice Kennedy? Was it Chief Justice Roberts, my guess, right? Who was it? Well, Kennedy's gone. And now the court actually granted a Second Amendment case for next term, which considers the question of whether you have a right to carry a gun outside the home. Um, I thought this would have been resolved by like 2011 or 12, you know, maybe a couple years after Heller, but now it'll be 2020 by the time the court actually gets around to it. 
And I'll give a little perspective, though. Think about the First Amendment, right? We had the early cases during the, the World War I, and then it took like decades for the Supreme Court to actually make sense of the First Amendment. Decades, right? I mean, talking like 30, 40 years. So in a sense, maybe I'm being a little bit too eager, right? Just take a step back, cool your horses, right? Cool your jets a bit. Uh, but the other part of me is like, the lower courts are going every which way, and the Supreme Court is denying review at every juncture. So all we have now for today is Heller and these lower court decisions, which I want to talk about today. Um, and it doesn't need to be said, this is a controversial topic. Um, the justices are bitterly divided on this issue. Um, Justice Stevens' dissent is, is, is very, uh, very, very angry. Um, and to this day, Justice Stevens is what, 95? He still gives speeches that Scalia was wrong, right? I mean, he has to stop saying this. He says Scalia was wrong in Heller, he was wrong in Heller, he was wrong in Prince, he was wrong in every other. Stevens wrote a book about why Scalia was wrong. Um, no one actually read it, I, I skimmed parts of it. But he wrote this very long missive about how Scalia was wrong in every case that he was dissenting in. But this case, Heller, Stevens is very pointed that Scalia was wrong. And then you have Justice Breyer, who writes a dissent in Heller that is not really consistent with Stevens, right? Breyer seems to just, okay, that whatever, whatever the second amendment means, it doesn't really matter. Let's talk about balancing pros and cons, right? It's almost as if like, yeah, we'll just assume this is right. I don't really care. I, I don't know how the two reconcile that. I think, I think it's a hard one for Stevens to, to uh, go with Breyer. And, and the crazy part is, as much as the majority rejects Breyer balancing, uh, the majority does Breyer balancing. And the lower courts sure as heck engage in briar type balancing. So in many regards, the most influential opinion Heller wasn't Scalia. It wasn't Justice Stevens. I think, at least in my opinion, that Justice Breyer's dissent has had the most impact on Second Amendment litigation over the last 10 years. Which is why I think I said this week ago, Breyer I think is an underrated justice. I don't think people give him enough credit. Um, he doesn't care about doctrine. He doesn't care about law in the formal sense. He cares about pragmatics. And for a lot of judges in the lower court, that's how they approach their jobs. Um, Scalia's discussions of operative clauses and prefatory clauses and you know commas and this all this stuff, lower court judges just don't care. Uh, so I think in many regards, Breyer has had the biggest impact of any Second Amendment judge in Heller uh, by a fairly long distance. Now, my hope is next year, when I teach this class next year, we'll have the decision in the New York Carry case, and we'll get something, anything to tell us what this means. But until then, I am the same place I was when I was a 3L, which is, which is many of you are. Yes, I was a 3L. Uh, it's Heller. That's all we got. All right. Any questions on that? Yeah, I've been wait waiting for one of these decisions for a very long time. Yeah. Okay. Who wants to go first? Who, who's next? I can't, I can't recall. Are you next? Um, oh, McKinney. All right. So McKinney, walk me through the District of Columbia's um, gun control uh, 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 regime. There, there are a couple aspects I want to talk about. Right. So they had passed this uh, law that basically it didn't outlaw the uh, ownership of private firearms, but it said if you did own a firearm, you had to keep it in your house either unloaded, disassembled, or with a uh, trigger lock on it. Well, but in order to have a gun, what did you have to do first? You have to apply for a, a license. And can you get one of them? Not really. No. The answer is no. And this is actually how Heller got his case, right? This is the insane part. Um, there were several people who wanted to challenge the D.C. gun law. Only Dick Heller, Mr. Heller, was found to have standing. Why? Dude went to City Hall, asked to register his gun. They said, no, we don't register guns. And that was it. He had an injury, right? He basically asked to do something that was impossible. He said he had a gun from the 70s that was sort of grandfathered in. And he asked them, can you please register my handgun? And they're like, no, we don't register handguns. Injury. The other plaintiffs, I think the lead plaintiff was named Parker. Was it Shelley Parker? I think it was Shelley Parker. I just Google me on that one. I think her name was Shelley Parker, if memory serves. She was the lead plaintiff. She not standing, right? She never actually bothered applying for a permit, which she wasn't going to get. So Dick Heller, again, it's, it's, it's insane. But Dick Heller had the foresight to apply for a permit he knew he was going to get denied for, which gave him an injury. 
And that's what he used to bring his lawsuit. And if at the Supreme Court, he's the only one that's standing. Okay. So McKinney's right. DC had this regime. It was a crime to have an unregistered firearm, and guess what? They wouldn't register your, 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 your handgun, right? They just won't register it. Uh, you're allowed to keep a long gun that has a rifle. Justice Breyer calls it a musket. He's insane, I swear. He, he knows that? He said, you can have a rifle or a musket at home. Like, like Breyer, come on. I'll tell you, when I, <laughs> this is bad. When I was in the, uh, the, 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 the George Mason Second Amendment Society, and uh, after Heller's decided, we actually went to the range, <laughs> and I put the Heller dissent up at the end, <laughs> and I lit it up. Um, but, but, but Breyer had this one line where he said, it's not, it's not in your book where he says, well, people can take a metro from DC to Virginia to go target shooting. He's like, that's okay. That means it's okay. I think that was the page I lit up. Uh, <laughs> Breyer, yeah, the musket. So, so you can have a long gun that has a rifle or a musket in your home, but you have to keep it dissembled, unloaded, and bound by a trigger lock, okay? Um, I won't presume any of you know how guns work, uh, but a trigger lock is basically a steel cable of some sort that goes between the, the trigger and the thing that actually fires, to simplify it. Um, if you try and pull the trigger when the lock's in there, it, the thing won't work. Uh, to unlock it, you either use a key, like a, like, a, like, a, like a key, or a combination where you put like, you know, three digits, you spin the tumblers. But the point is, the gun has to be completely uh, non-functional uh, at your home. And, and uh, this actually came up with the oral arguments, right? How much time does it take to actually uh, remove a trigger lock. Uh, you know, maybe if you have maybe five, ten seconds. Uh, if you're sleeping and it's dark, you have to find your glasses, maybe 30 seconds. I mean, we, we could quibble over how much time, uh, but there's some burden. The court didn't really talk much about the trigger lock. They sort of just punted on that. And it comes back to one of the cases later. But as the, the, the core of the case was, um, did you have a right to keep and bear arms uh, to keep a gun in your house, a uh, handgun of any sort, okay? Um, they sued, the trial court ruled against Mr. Heller, um, the Court of Appeals reversed. This was a big deal, because this was the first time a Federal Court of Appeals ruled that the Second Amendment protects a right to keep a gun. Uh, there's been hints at it, there was a case in the Fifth Circuit, I think called Emerson, uh, and a few others uh, that hinted there was such a right. And you may recall Justice Thomas's dissent in Lopez, or was it Prince? One of them where he suggested that this might violate the Second Amendment. This was the, uh, the Brady handgun bill. So there were some rumblings that the Second Amendment might have some teeth. But this was a very big change. All right, now let's take a step back. Um, we've only come, or you probably can't. If you were my class, you say Crookshank, right? Uh, this was a Colfax massacre case. Uh, if you weren't in my class, you probably didn't study that case. But shortly after Reconstruction in the 1870s, there was a case called United States versus Crookshank. Uh, the facts of this case are gruesome. Um, there was basically a group of African Americans who were in a, a town in Louisiana. There was a disputed election. Uh, the African Americans were Republicans. They thought they, their guy won the election. And then the white people were, uh, they were Democrats, and they thought they won the election. Um, no, they didn't go to court to resolve it. Uh, they had a lynching. Um, basically, the, uh, the, the black contingency uh, were uh, inside of a courthouse, inside the, the, this town in Colfax. And this lynch mob uh, lit the courthouse on fire. Uh, they burned these people to death. Um, those that managed to escape were shot and dragged down by the river. Uh, it's a gruesome case. I go watch my lecture from last year about it. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the hardest cases for me to teach. Um, the federal government brought charges against the lynch mob, or at least the leader of the lynch mob, Mr. Crookshank, and they charged him with violating the First and Second Amendment rights of the, uh, the African American group. That basically that he blocked their right to peacefully assemble and he blocked their right to keep and bear arms. Uh, the court dismissed the indictment uh, because they said that the Second Amendment, whatever it means, um, did not apply to the state. In other words, that, this, that state actors were not bound by the Second Amendment. So Crookshank wasn't 
a real discussion of what the right to bear arms meant. But here you basically had an organized group of people who were arming themselves to fight off a lynch mob. Um, is that a militia in the sense of, um, you know, Battle of Bunker Hill? Not really. It's a bunch of guys with guns defending themselves. Um, some years later, there's a case called Miller, uh, which considered a, a ban on what's called a short-barreled shotgun. And that was a very strange case. Mr. Miller didn't even present an argument. And the court had some discussion of how uh, the sorts of guns protected by the Second Amendment are those tied to service in the militia. Uh, but they didn't quite say that only those in the militia have guns. Again, it was sort of a weird opinion, a very strange opinion that Justice Stevens was nervous about. So with those two cases out of the way, there wasn't really much of a um, court record about what the Second Amendment means. Um, scholarship, though, guys like me, law professors, uh, began to develop contrary arguments. Um, they began to develop arguments that the Second Amendment was what's called an individual right. That it was a right that belongs to people not connected to service and militia. The opposite side initially developed a model called the state's right model or the collective model. And I'll describe it briefly because um, it's not the one Stevens uses. But it was the idea that, this, that the Second Amendment protects the right of states to maintain militias. Um, that might be the one you thought is the correct one, uh, but even Stevens abandons it. It creates a lot of problems uh, when you have a provision of the Bill of Rights that actually guarantees the right of the people, uh, but the argument is only means states can have militias. So soon enough, scholars developed another version uh, of the Second Amendment, which is, at least if I can say it right, I always say it wrong. It's a right, it's an individual right to bear arms in the militia. In other words, if a state has a militia, then individuals can keep a gun for militia services. But the ability to keep a gun is contingent on the state authorizing you to be in the militia. Did I do that right? I think I did. In other words, let me see if I can do that one more time, but that wasn't that, wasn't that good. Um, if a state abandons the militia, then you can't have a gun. But so long as a state has a militia and you're allowed to be in that militia, then you have an indiv individual right to keep the gun at your home. And when called to duty, you can use that gun for militia purposes. I think I got that right. I always have trouble saying it uh, because it, it just it strikes me as uh, 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 cards on the table, a bizarre theory, right? M Scalia might be wrong. I think he's wrong about some stuff. But the, the model of the Stevens descent is a, is a very strange right, that it's a right to keep a gun in your home, but only so long as you, you can use that gun in militia service. I think, I think I got that one right. Okay, And then there were competing scholarship going back and forth. Uh, most famously, Chief Justice Berger uh, basically said that the individual model was a fraud or a scam. He said, don't believe it. It's not true. Um, and then people kept writing articles and there were scholarly debates. And then it gets to Heller. Uh, at the time Heller was decided, uh, I think 49 out of 50 states had uh, rights to bear arm provisions in their constitutions. Um, Illinois was the one exception, if I remember correctly. Um, at the time Heller was argued, only two places in the United States banned handguns altogether, uh, D.C. and Chicago. So basically 49 out of 50 states had a right to bear arms, and virtually every city in the country allowed you to keep a gun at home with certain hoops you have to jump through, right? DC and Chicago, the ones with the outright bans. So even in the absence of any judicial precedent, and even the absence of any sort of clear historical answer, uh, virtually every state allowed you to keep a handgun at home, right? Then what is Justice Stevens and Breyer so angry about? Because they were afraid that this decision would not only affect handguns, but would creep open the door for other sorts of gun regulations, right? Once you get beyond handguns, gun regulations vary wildly from state to state, and that's what they were afraid of. Okay, any questions of that? And we'll do Stevens much more in depth later in class. Okay, uh, all right, Nathan, you wanna, let's just walk through the Second Amendment text for a bit, right? There are two parts, right? There's what's called the prefatory clause and what's called the operative clause. Okay, I'll read the entire thing. It says, 
a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Um, if you ever go to the NRA headquarters in, in Fairfax, Virginia, you walk in, there's a huge plaque over the door. And it says, the right of the people to keep bear, bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, they don't include the first part. Right? The first part's not, not there. I mean, it's, just, it's like over the, over the walkway, there's a humongous sign, right? The prefatory clause and the operative clause. Prefatory clause, a well-regulated regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. You have the operative clause, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay, so the case turns in large part on how the justices understand the interaction between the prefatory clause or the prologue and the operative clause. So Nathan, walk me through Scalia, just his general approach, and we'll drill down, we'll spend some time on this, but what's Scalia's general approach to the linkage between the necessary, sorry, the prefatory and the operative clause? So he kind of says that while the prefatory clause indicates that the Second Amendment not, was created to uh, protect militia men carrying arms, uh, it really doesn't change the fact that uh, it, it merely gives context and that the actual, like you said, operative clause, like the actual words of the actual amendment are what really matters. And mm -hmm. the operative words don't indicate in any way, shape, or form a limit. Yes, okay, that's a key point, right? Justice Scalia says that the prefatory clause does not limit the operative clause. Right, Scalia says the prefatory clause does not limit the operative clause. It merely announces a purpose for it. Not all purposes, perhaps one purpose, or maybe one of the very important purposes, right? Um, I'll give you an example. I'm going to paraphrase it to make it a little easier. Uh, but at the time, there was a law called the Northwest Ordinance, which was a law Congress passed to govern the Northwest Territories. And there was one provision that said something like, uh, Education being necessary uh, to a good citizenry, I'm paraphrasing, make it easier. Education being necessary to good citizenry, uh, the students shall have access to schools, right? In other words, we think education is really important, so students will have access to schools, right? Uh, even if we decide education is not important, students will have access to schools. Now, that's not a resolving of everything, but that was some of the examples that Scalia musters about how the prefatory clause merely announces a purpose, but doesn't limit the operative clause. Yeah. So do you think that kind of like bleeds over from this whole thing of like not wanting to look into like the legislative? Oh, OK. I'll do this now. Yeah. The biggest divide between Justice Scalia and the majority and Justice Stevens is on the question that Nathan uh, just asked. Yeah, uh, exactly. What, what's the word? What, what's the Purpose of them. Well, yeah, yeah. When they're looking at like the... Legislative history. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me take a step back. Um, at various junctures this semester, we've talked about originalism, right? Um, there are different schools of originalism. Uh, one school is called original public meaning, right? How would the public have understood the words in the Second Amendment? The other school is commonly known as original intent. Right? What did the framers intend when they wrote something? Um, Justice Scalia's opinion is largely based on original public meaning. Right? How were the phrases, uh, the right of the people, to keep, to bear, arms? Right? How would each of these words have been understood by a person reading it? Justice Stevens criticizes, you know, this is like the elephant and touching the blind guy, right? You can't just look at little parts little bit by bit. Stevens says, what did the framers intend, right? What were they afraid of? What were they trying to protect? What did James Madison think? There's an entire excerpt from your book, which I don't have for you to read, it's long, where Stevens goes to the drafting history and looks at how various versions of this provision 
or change. Is aha, Madison made this change and James Madison made that change, which means that Madison wanted this and Madison wanted that. It's very similar to the Establishment Clause. Remember Justice Souter, his dissent in Levy Weissman, right? Where he walked through the various history, the drafting history of the various um, uh, versions of the Establishment Clause. Well, they left this language in, but they took out that language, and here's the inference we can draw. The Scalia model, the original public meaning, puts less weight in that sort of history. It doesn't really matter what Madison intended, what was in his heart of hearts, Scalia would say. What matters is the words they chose. And Stephen says, well, we, we don't really know what the words they chose meant, but we know what they intended. Um, so these are these huge problems that originalists often grapple with, right? For example, why do we pick Madison, right? He was just one of many. What about the rest of the people maybe disagreed with him? What about contemporaries who wrote about this, both at the time of the framing and the years afterwards? What weight do we give to statements after the provision was enacted? Stevens is very angry that Scalia says, you're citing things from years later? Let's stick with Madison at the time of the framing. He's very angry about that part. So I think, Nathan, your question is very well put. Um, and depending what approach of originalism you use, you get a very different answer. Uh, but an important point is they're both originalists, right? Stevens had to go down history. He couldn't just say, well, in a modern society, we don't really need guns, so we'll just move on. Breyer does that. That's Breyer, right? which is why the two of them are very much at odds. I think Breyer had to really hold his nose to join the Stevens opinion. He couldn't care less about originals. It doesn't matter to him. And I don't say that in a critical way. It's not important to him. Okay? So Scalia walks through each of the various elements of the Second Amendment. Uh, he looks at the phrase, right of the people. He says, look, this phrase, right of the people, it's used elsewhere. We see it in the Fourth Amendment. Right? The right of the people to be secure in the persons. We see it in the petition clause, the right of the people to petition for redress of grievances. And Scalia says this, the people, right of the people, refers to an individual right. Now Stephen says, no, that's not right. The right of the people is a right we all hold together. Um, who's right? Uh -huh. I think they both have fairly compelling arguments in that point. I think Scalia's a little bit stronger, but I think they both make good arguments. Uh, then Scalia goes to the phrase, keep arms, right? Does keep arms only have a military context? Scalia says no, right? Keep arms was prevalent in uh, 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 non-military usages. Then Scalia says bear arms, right? Um, did bear arms only... Uh, have a military context? He said, no, not only. Scalia was wrong about this one. <laughs> uh, I did a, I'm working on a paper now that looks at uh, how the framers use various words in a very large database, what's called corpus linguistics. Like 90 something percent of bare arms had a military connotation. So I think Scalia was basically making this part up. I don't think it disproves his opinion, but I think this part Scalia was a little bit off base. Um, anyway, again, it's interesting, but I think Scalia screwed this part up. OK. Then he goes, the operative clause has history, right? Uh, look at the English Bill of Rights. Uh, William Blackson, one of the great jurists who wrote about American law, uh, or sorry, English law. Uh, King George III disarmed the colonists. Uh, each of these people discussed the right to bear arms outside the context of militia. Why? England had no militia, right? If the Brits were using the phrase bear arms, they were not talking about a militia because they didn't have any. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. Okay, then Scalia moves on to the prefatory clause. Um, he goes again, word by word. Well-regulated militia. Now, the word regulated doesn't mean what you think it means today. It's not like they were under control. Uh, regulated means like disciplined. They were trained, right? They could you know, march in line and, you know, do that little thing where they spin the gun around. They, 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 were, they were regulated, they were trained, they were disciplined. Um, free state, security of a free state. Uh, this is not talking about individual states, Scalia says, but about the entire nation, the entire polity. Okay. Now we get to the key point. Does the preface fit with the operative clause? Scalia says yes. The prefatory clause does not suggest that preserving the militia was the only reason Americans value this ancient right. Okay. 
it's one of many reasons, one of which is to safeguard against tyranny. Um, he sort of mentions this point, but I want to dwell on it for a bit. What does that mean? Um, historically, one of the most predictable moves of any dictator is to disarm people. Um, it's happened in every society since the beginning of firearms, right? If a leader wants to oppress his people, he disarms them. That way they can't rebel. Uh, pick whatever dictator you want, he did it. Um, King George III among them. He tried to disarm the colonists to uh, weaken their resolve to uh, engage in rebellion. Um, so the idea of the Second Amendment isn't just about hunting or keeping people burglars of your home, but also resisting tyranny. Um, now, is that an outmoded concern, Scalia says? Uh, you know, how could, how could it be that people with small guns can take on an army? Uh, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam. Uh, just go down the list. The most powerful armies in the world were held at bay for years by people with small arms. Um, it's actually, I think people don't understand how, how hard it is to take out an armed populace, but Scalia hints at that very gently. Uh, there was one judge who called the Second Amendment a doomsday provision. Uh, that's when everything else goes out the door, that's the one you got left. Whatever that's worth. Okay. All right. Then Scalia moves on. Post-ratification commentary. Now this one's trickier, right? Noel, why is it problematic that Scalia is looking to stuff that came after ratification to figure out what the provision meant at the time of ratification? Why is that problematic, potentially? Now, there's why is it problematic to look at the 18th century stuff, you know, 1800s, when the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791? Why is it problematic? No, that's true. But why do you think it's problematic in particular if you're an originalist and you're looking for stuff that came decades after the founding? Well, because the contemporary meaning would have been different. Ah, so maybe the meaning changed. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. So in other words, whatever the Second Amendment meant in 1791, maybe the meaning drifted in years later, right? This is a non-trivial concern. I think Stephen raises a fair point. Um, I'll give you an easy example. Right, the Constitution says, uses the phrase domestic <coughs> violence, right? That in case of domestic violence, you know, there can be uh, habeas corpus might be suspended or whatever, right? Okay, domestic violence, the word used in the Constitution, doesn't mean what it means today. When we say domestic violence in the year 2019, it means spousal abuse, right? Uh, problems in the home. Um, that's not what the Constitution is talking about. So when you're trying to ascertain meaning, you want the meaning to be the same as when it was adopted. So for example, if, I'm, if, if a statute was drafted in the 1930s, and I want to use a dictionary to define a word used in that statute, I wouldn't use the modern day dictionary. I would use a dictionary that was produced at the time that document or the thing was drafted. Um, now Scalia says, well, even if the time elapsed, there's no indication the meaning changed. He says, in fact, the meaning was consistent from the time of the framing until the 18th century, I'm sorry, 19th century. But I think Stevens raises a fair point here that Scalia doesn't have a sharp enough response to. Okay. Yeah, Noel. But, I mean, kind of to that same point, I mean, I, it just kind of reminds me that the, the folks that wrote, you know, that wrote the amendments, I mean, they weren't exact, I mean, they, they knew and they, I they knew the law. I mean, weren't a lot of them attorneys. And they were. And so they knew that, and they had experience that in the past things changed. So it's not like the meetings that they left were, were so closed that they didn't anticipate any change. I, I mean, I would say that they did anticipate that they would. And how, how, how would the Constitution be changed? Not the Constitution itself, but that society would change. And when society changed, what does that do to the language used in the Constitution? Can you repeat the question? Well, I, I think your point is that they recognize that society would change, right? 
And when society change, what does that then do to the language used in the Constitution? Does that change the language? Well, no, the, the, the language stays the same. So, okay, so yes, the language stays the same. So then, what, what's the what's the up? What what happens then when society changes? Just one at a time. Um, no, of course, society changes. But when, when society changes, what 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 should then happen? And how do you revisit the meaning of the Constitution? You're fighting the answer. Well, you, you know the answer, and you're fighting, I can tell. It's okay. I mean, you, you incorporate the, the new technology. By what means? Well, it's automatic because you know, it's inevitable that, that there's going to be change. <laughs> Noel, you not you don't want to say the answer I'm looking for. I know you know what I'm saying. You're fighting it real hard. The answer they won't say is amendment, right? Um, of course, language change and meanings changes. Uh, but then the question is, who gets to the updating, right? Is the updating done through the amendment process, or is the updating done through some sort of common law judicial process? Right, if the meaning of a word changes, now, in some regards, freedom of speech, right? How was speech done in the 1790s? Through spoken word, through the printing press. They didn't have computers, they didn't have iPhones. Um, so even the most devout originalists would say that you can simply uh, apply the words of the Constitution, a speech, to new context, right? So about the Fourth Amendment, right? To be secure in your person's papers and effects. Um, people didn't have iPhones back in the 1790s. They do today. Uh, if the government wants to search your iPhone, um, that's kind of your property, kind of your effect, maybe. You can apply the technology of the day to the provision of the Constitution. Now, Noel's saying something different. He's saying, well, maybe guns aren't so helpful today as they were once a generation ago. Um, but if it's a right of individuals to keep a gun, is that the same thing as saying that now speech applies to an iPhone, right? Is it the same sort of updating? Right? I think the, the part of society changing is, well, it's not just muskets, but I may have a, may I maybe have a rifle as well in modern technology. That goes through what an arm is, but not what the right itself is. No one else want to talk about that? It's, a fair, it's, it's an important question. Noel, I was trying to drag it out of him, but uh, it's OK. He, he fought me valiantly. So yeah. Nobody's arguing. It's an RBG launcher? Yeah. I think that'd be, that'd be really dangerous. Right, no. Uh, so Scalia, and I'll jump in to answer Kyle's question. Scalia sort of, this is actually part three, but I'll get there in a minute. Scalia basically just flubs this part, right? Uh, there were a number of briefs submitted in Heller that made a couple arguments, right? One, we should have a right to this sort of gun uh, used uh, uh, by the Current day militia, which is the the military. RPG. Yeah, they have. Are you used to? I'm hearing RBG. Oh. Is your RBG? I thought you were making a pun. Yeah, I'm saying an RBG launcher. That'd be, that'd be really dangerous. She goes. She, she'd go flying. Okay. Thank you. Right. So then, what exactly are the arms protected? Right. Is is it just what Justice Breyer said? You can have a a flint like a flintlock musket. Or the type of weapon that the uh, military uses would not be an M16, but maybe something, a variant, maybe an M4, right? Or is it the lineal descendant of the sort of gun a person in the time of the founding would use to keep, a, keep in their home, which would probably be including a handgun and most small rifles, right? There were various briefs submitted giving the court options, and the court just totally whiffed on that question which is why the later case about the so-called assault weapons, mm -hmm. they had nothing to go on, right? But I'll, I want to get back to your point in a minute. I promise I will. But anyone else on the point of the, of the speech gun analogy with the iPhones? Anyone want to talk about this for a minute? Has anybody tried to pass this through an amendment? Ever to repeal the Second Amendment? Yeah. I'm just curious. I, so 
I, I've done the math on this. I think if there was actually, if you count the number of small states, you're more likely to get an amendment promoting the Second Amendment rather than reducing it. Right? There are a lot of small states with a lot of guns in them, and a lot of big states without, but there are a few of them. I remember when Heller's decided, oh, this is why I didn't went to a law firm, one of the partners of the firm said, don't worry, we'll amend the Second Amendment to repeal it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and anyway, I said that, I shouldn't have said it. But, but uh, it, it, it's probably not gonna happen. A lot of states actually have fairly robust uh, bear arm provisions. That's sort of redundant, because if the state has good gun laws, they don't really need that. Uh, what matters is if there's a federal uh, gun control policy, uh, that would be the next uh, uh, challenge. But we haven't had any of those in a while. Um, although they do come up with, uh, with felon disenfranchisement. So for example, if you committed you know, a nonviolent felony 20 years ago, should you be, fa which, should you be forever deprived of your right to bear arms? Uh, Martha Stewart for, is the classic example. Right? Why can't she have a gun? She, you know, she, she, didn't, she didn't hurt anyone. She made these little doily. What? I said obvious reasons. Well, the obvious reason. Tell me. Would you give her a gun? Yeah, she's badass. <laughs> <laughs> He did, he did. She has pent up anger. All those doilies she's cutting over the years? Exactly. Oh, God. Um, let's go to part three of the Scalia opinion, uh, please. Um, part three sort of comes out of nowhere, right? Part two is all like, I am the originalist, bow before me. And then part three is like, all right, whatever. And the question is, why is part three there? Was it added to placate John Roberts? My theory. Was it added to placate Anthony Kennedy? Possibly. Uh, was it Kennedy and Roberts? Was it Kennedy, Roberts, and Alito? I don't know. And, and I, we won't know for a very long time. But for whatever reason, part three is there. You know Scalia doesn't believe what he's saying here, right? You can just see him like, I need five votes. I need five votes. Or, you know, uh, but he needed five votes. Uh, so let's walk through part three. He says, like most rights, the right secured is not unlimited. Well, you don't say. Okay, tell us how. Okay, we, I'm going to read this verbatim. He says, although we do not undertake an exhaustive historical analysis today of the full scope of the Second Amendment, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on possession of firearms by felons mentally ill. That's Martha Stewart, among others. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings. Just query for a minute. He mentioned carrying uh, guns in certain places. Does that mean you can carry in other places? Ooh. Inference, right? Or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. That means basically background checks and uh, various licensing requirements. Then you get our favorite footnote 26. We identify these presumptively lawful regulatory measures only as examples. Our list does not purport to be exhaustive. In other words, lower courts have added. Uh, this was, I think, has been added to, to placate someone that you wouldn't have lower courts sort of setting aside gun control laws. Let me tell you something. Every single Second Amendment decision quotes this paragraph without fail. They quote this paragraph over and over and over again. That's all they quote. It's the only thing that actually matters. Okay. Then Scalia says, this is Kyle's question from a minute ago, what actually weapons are protected? So they cite this Miller case. This is a case about the, um, uh, the sawed-off shotgun uh, from the 1920s or 30s. It was an old case. And he says, Miller said that the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time. Which time? I think now, I think. We think that limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. Does that mean dangerous and unusual or just a dangerous weapon suffice? Some courts have seemed to say that if it's dangerous, that's enough. Well, sh all guns are dangerous. The, per the reason why a gun exists is to kill people and break things. That's why, that's why the gun exists. Uh, Dangerous and unusual. Okay. Weapons most useful in military service, like the M16, if it's banned, then the right is attached from the prefatory clause. Uh, modern developments have limited the degree of fit between the prefatory clause 
and the protected right, but they cannot change our interpretation of the right. So Kyle, your question is, he basically says, we don't really know what guns are protected, we'll deal with it later. Um, most Second Amendment scholars would actually say, and this is to be true, that if you want to talk about the weapon that should be protected, it's not the handgun, it's the AR. Uh, it, it's, it's a weapon. It's a, an AR does not stand for assault rifle, it's an armor light, it's a brand name. It basically an M4 or an AR-15, right? That's the sort of weapon used in the militia. That would be the weapon we should all have, not the handgun. Uh, and indeed, handgun violence is most, I'm sorry, most gun deaths in this country are caused by handguns, not rifles. Uh, it's, it's a common myth. But uh, yeah, Kyle Scalia just, he sort of just, he just throws his hands up, or maybe Scalia would do one of these, right? He's just like, he's like I, I, I can't deal with this now. We'll figure it out later. And again, he died before he got to another Second Amendment opinion, which is insane, right? People always talk about, you know, the long game at the Supreme Court, you know, you're very incremental. People die. Composition changes. Elections happen, right? Had, you know, President Clinton won the election, or had Hillary Clinton become President Clinton, uh, I think Heller would have basically been stopped in his tracks and said, okay, you can have a gun at the home, nothing else, that's it, go home, bye-bye. And no other laws would be challenged. Right, had the election gone the other way, I was ready to throw in the towel in the Second Amendment. It's like, what the hell's the point, right? So any sort of long, oh, we'll deal with it later, presumes far too much stability. They don't have that in the court. YOLO, right, just, just do what you're gonna do and, and worry about it later. I actually put that in the paper once. <laughs> okay, all right, so then the court turns to the DC law and they say, there's a handgun ban under any of the standards of scrutiny that we've applied to an enumerated constitutional right. This fails. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, generally, if you remember footnote four of Caroline Products, right? That says when you have an enumerated right, oh, Brittany's covering her face. It always comes back to Caroline Products. When you have an enumerated right in the Bill of Rights, you have to apply heightened scrutiny. Now, in the First Amendment context, that means strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny. We've done a few of these cases, right? Like the O'Brien test, for example. So it's not rational basis. Rational basis is out. But it's some sort of intermediate scrutiny or strict scrutiny. Beyond that, we're not going to tell you what it is, right? The Bush administration actually filed a brief in this case saying, please do not apply strict scrutiny. Surprising, isn't it? Like George Bush's administration. In fact, Dick Cheney filed a brief opposite of his boss, which was, it's a very Cheney move. But W's administration, Paul Clement, the lawyer, filed a brief saying, please don't apply strict scrutiny, because he said basically all federal gun control laws would be unconstitutional. Some of you are celebrating, smiling. Yes, but if you actually apply an actual strict scrutiny to the federal gun control laws, they're basically all bad, right? They're very, they're, they're not in any way targeted to actual problems. They're mostly, mostly fear-mongering, right? Uh, the court took that lead. And there was one part in the oral argument where John Roberts goes, why do we have to decide scrutiny? Can't we just deal with it later? But Roberts says, let's just deal with this later. We don't have to decide scrutiny now. And that's what they did. So I think Roberts was part of the problem. Um, then Scalia says, okay, so now we're gonna talk about handguns. Why do you need a handgun, right? Why can't DC say, okay, you just keep your long gun, but you can't have a handgun? Scalia says, well, <laughs> I love this. It can't be wrestled away by an attacker. Guns are long. It's easier to use without upper body strength. <laughs> it can be pointed at a burglar with one hand while the other hand dials the police, I, I, right, I, I guess. <laughs> I mean, again, after part one and two with all this, like, you know, this historical study, this part three, I just, I lose it every time I read it. It's like, come on, come on, school, you gotta do better than this. I mean, speakerphone, I guess, <laughs> Bluetooth, put a Bluetooth in. Alexa, call the cop, no, you can do Alexa back then. I mean, I, I don't know. Upper body, the, actually the upper body strength thing is non-trivial. There are actually are guns used that can be fired with your foot. Imagine you're an amputee and you want a gun in your house. You can actually um, fire a gun with a foot. They have various modifications. Uh, there was one case, I think it was from New Jersey or somewhere up northeast, where there was a blind person who wanted to have a gun. <laughs> uh, don't laugh. I mean, people who are blind are actually more likely to be victims than anyone else. So he wanted a gun to defend himself. And he basically said, yeah, someone comes in, I'm just firing. <laughs> Uh, what? Between a felon and a blind person, I would rather a felon have it. I think a rehabilitated felon. 
I don't remember what happened to the blonde guy with the gun. I don't think he got his permit. Um, but <sighs> okay. All right. So any other questions on part three so far? All right. Then Scalia walks through Breyer. He says, you know, we don't apply interest balancing to the constitutional enumerated rights. So like imagine a scale, right? And on one side, you have the benefits of the law. And on the other side, you have the burdens. You sort of just weigh the scale, see which side's heavier. Um, I know Justice Breyer every single time how that one weighs out. There's not even a question, right? Uh, every single time, Breyer would say, why do you need a gun? You call the police. You know, who needs a gun? Um, so when you have this sort of interest balancing, it always leans towards the state. Um, pause here to contrast Breyer's opinion here with Holman's health, the abortion case. Uh, he applies what looks a lot like strict scrutiny in the abortion context, uh, but here he's very much about democracy. Uh, I'll leave that for you to, to think about. Okay. Scalia finishes. Uh, we are not going to declare the Second Amendment extinct. Okay. All right. So any questions on the Scalia opinion? There's just so much, and then you get to the end, it's like, whoa, where'd that come from? The upper body strength part? I mean... I, I, every time I read them, I'm like, really? This is the best you can come up with? Like, that, that, that's the crescendo, right? That's the close one. I was like, oh my God, that's it, Scalia, really? Yeah. So just to be clear, uh, the court's still undecided on what scrutiny. The, the, lower the lower courts have more or less said we apply intermediate scrutiny. That's more or less what the lower courts have said. Some of the circuits have called it heightened scrutiny, but it's sort of intermediate. It looks a lot like rational basis. Uh, one of the key differences between rational basis and intermediate scrutiny is who bears the burden, right? Generally with rational basis scrutiny, the individual has the burden to show that the law is unreasonable. And with intermediate scrutiny, the government has to show that their law is reasonable. So the difference, who has the burden? Most of the courts applying intermediate scrutiny have put the burden on the challengers right, to show that the law is unreasonable. And even where the government doesn't have enough evidence, some courts have actually supplied extra evidence to make the government's case stronger. That is not a hallmark of any sort of heightened scrutiny. That's, that's basically deferential, rational basis review. The court can make your argument for you. There was one case where uh, uh, Judge Sykes, who wrote the opinion in Ezelia, read, Judge, Ry Judge Sykes wrote that the, uh, the majority gave uh, a decisive assist to the government. Right, they basically gave them support where they didn't make the case themselves. Uh, and that sort of review is not consistent with rational basis. Yeah, okay. All right, so any other questions on Scalia majority? Okay, now you might at least forget part three. We'll just, we won't talk about that. Again, I, 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 I like the opinion, but part three makes me wince every time I read it. Let's, let's focus on part two for a bit. Um, you might think, wow, part two is super persuasive. But then you get to Scalia. I'm sorry, then you get to Stevens, right? And you get to Stevens' dissent. Uh, I think, John, you're next. Um, how does Stevens approach the history argument here? What, what's, his, what's, his, uh, what's his contrary take? Mm. Stevens, what's in there? I mean, the only thing I have highlighted about that was that he, what, what he thought it was to be about the collective approach. About well, be precise. What exactly was the right that Stevens thought that people had? Because he says, like in the first paragraph, the question presented by this case is not whether the Second Amendment protects a collective right or an individual right. Surely protects a right that can be forced by individuals. So he rejects the collective model altogether, which is a common misconception about Stevens. He doesn't go states' rights. He doesn't adopt that at all. Right, John? What, what is the, the Stevensian, the, the, the Stevens? I don't know. What is the Stevens approach to the Second Amendment? What does it actually mean? He's, he likes saying it's Scalia is wrong. That, that much we can agree. But what it, what it, how exactly does Stevens characterize the right? Yeah, 
Ryan, you want to take a step? Yeah, I was going to say that. He thinks that the rights bear on to the military. But then how is that individual right? In the very first paragraph, he says this is, can be enforced by individuals. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's it. Dumb. I'm sorry, it's what? Dumb, in my opinion. Like, obviously, the militia is going to give you permission to use a weapon. You're not going to need to enforce well, it. Well, yeah, let, let me defend Stevens for a bit. Now, I, 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 I'll, I'll give him a defense and I'll criticize, but I want to defend him for a bit first, right? So the way, at the time of the framing, right, states had militias, and they were controlled by state officials, right? And usually the states were responsible for arming their militias. But in some cases, the states would say, you bring your own rifle to our militia service. Um, when you're home, you can keep it, use it for hunting, whatever you want. But when we call you up, you use your gun for militia service, right? Stevens thinks that the Second Amendment was a fear, that the federal government would step in and disarm the state militias, right? That Congress would pass laws that would prevent the militias from having guns, which would basically would disband the militia without guns to go very far. So even if these were guns that individuals had in the service of the state militia, Congress could not then interfere with their service in the state militia. Does that make a little sense? Very, very good. Well, you know, imagine it this way, right? The militia didn't have like a standing facility to keep guns just as a, you know, as a warehouse, right? Unless the militia was called up, it didn't exist. So people would keep their guns because they were authorized to do so by state law for purposes of the militia. And then when they were called up, they were mustered, they would then bring their guns, whatever they were called, and then they would use it for whatever the, the commander tells them to use. So if the purpose were to protect the state organized militias. No, the individuals in the state organized militias, just be very careful, right? Well, that's the difference it makes, right? Because he's, he's not saying that protects the state militias as militias, mm -hmm. it protects the individuals in the state militias to bear arms. Right. So you would have to have a situation where the militia is not allowing this person to have a weapon, right? Where the, no, Congress, where Congress is telling an individual he can't bring his gun to the militia service. Yes, I think that's it. He, Stevens doesn't actually state this, right. and you're probably frustrated for reason, because it sounds, we say dumb? Dumb, yeah, because in order for it to have any effect whatsoever, for, like, for Congress to prohibit one person to bring a weapon, they would have to prohibit all the militia members from bringing their weapons. And in that case, the state has better, let's say, position to in enforce that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, Con I'll get to Colby, I'll get to you in a second. But I suppose Congress could say, we will allow the Massachusetts militia to exist, but we will prohibit individuals in the militia from bring bringing guns to service. And it doesn't, that, to me, that uh, renders this amendment without effect, without, with very little. Effect. Very, I mean, I think that's fair, right? Uh, it's, it's a very trivial, in other words, if Congress was afraid, I'm sorry, if the framers were afraid of Congress disarming individuals who served in militias, the bigger fear would be they just disband the militias altogether. Right. And that's not what they're prohibited from doing. No. So all, in the mind of Stevens, and if you, if you think I'm wrong, I always, I always get this one confused in my own head, but I think in the mind of Justice Stevens, what's actually prohibited is Congress passing a law that bars individuals authorized to use a gun in militia service from keeping a gun for militia service. So that way, if something happens, they can't call them up. Mm -hmm. Is that, does anyone else see it differently? Again, one of the study guide questions is how would you frame the Justice Stevens dissent? And I often, I struggle with this one myself. I think it's, I think it's hard to conceptualize the exact thing. He could say Scalia's wrong, and you might think Scalia's wrong, but then Scalia's wrong, what's the right answer? Or maybe there's no answer. Maybe the answer is we don't know, so just let the democratic process figure it out, which is Breyer. Breyer's like, I don't really care what this means, don't bother me. It doesn't matter what the people in Massachusetts thought 200 years ago. I don't care. Guns are bad. I'm okay, right? Um, yeah, but I think, is it you, I think a little more clarity? Right. Scalia is the only one that, to me, you read through the opinion and it's like, yep, that's what it says. You may not like that that's what it says, so pass an amendment, but I don't it, it, like the. Yeah, uh, Colby, your hand was patiently, patiently waiting, yeah. So Scalia describes the militia as well, or describes in the Constitution what Congress can pass as a well which is the armies and the navies. And that well, no, 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 no. The, the, the militias were the citizenry. It, right. All able-bodied males were in the, uh, under the age of, was it 40 well, or whatever? He was contradicting Stevens in the aspect of, like, he's referring to militia, but Congress has a right to... 
Congress right. can raise right. armies, right. right? Congress can raise armies and they can organize the militias, but at the most basic level, the militias were all able-bodied males. Okay, and so able-bodied males on the aspect, so in order to prevent them from doing that using Stevens, or Stevens' reasoning with the militia, why doesn't, in order for everybody just to have arms, just have everybody join the militia? Okay, so you mean today? Yes. So I've actually looked into this. Um, uh, <laughs> a student asked me this question about a year ago. I was at one of my lectures. He said, what if, you know, Texas decided to admit every single Texan into the Texas militia and made the standard issue weapon the AR-15? and said, you're all now obligated to keep this um, a as part of you know, your standard issue. Um, I don't have a particularly good answer in response, but I think it's a, it's a fair question, right? In other words, if, if Stevens is right, which I don't think he is, but if Stevens is right, then the response of Texas, for example, could be, okay, we are now admitting every Texan into the militia and we'll make the standard issue weapon, which you have to keep on your own time, uh, uh, an AR-15, and maybe we'll call you up, maybe you won't, if Stevens is right. I, I mean, in that regard, if Stevens is right, it could potentially obliterate federal gun control laws. I think that's what you're asking me. Right. Yeah, I, I don't, I haven't, I haven't given that a lot of thought, but I had a student ask that last year, and I have to, I told him something, I can't remember what I told him. I think it was smarter than what I just said. Yeah, Kyle. I could definitely be wrong, but I think I remember reading on Wikipedia. Oh, God. That actually is the law in Switzerland, but they have to keep their Yes. Home. The Swiss, right. uh, they're required to keep AKs in their home. And they never got taken over, right? Damn straight. <laughs> Come and take it, as they say. Yeah. Um, all right. Does everyone get the Stevens approach, right? It's not about individual versus collective model. That's not what Stevens is actually arguing. He's saying that individuals can't be deprived by Congress of the right to use guns that state law authorizes them to use in the militia. Oh, I think I got that one. I think that one was actually good, right? That Congress can't deprive individuals of the right to use guns, that their states authorize them to keep in the militia. Okay, I think I finally got it. Okay. It's, a hard, it's a hard thing to articulate. Uh, by the way, none of this is about state gun control laws. Um, in fact, if it, McDonald, which was a case decided two years later, which I didn't assign, but it's in your book, uh, the court basically said whatever the Second Amendment means against Congress, it means against the states, which I think is garbage. Um, the, the right to bear arms was actually much more concrete in the 1860s. If you look at the Colfax massacre, Crookshank, people needed guns to defend themselves against lynch mobs, right? That's what, you didn't have militias at that point. You needed to defend yourself against the KKK, right, the Klan. Uh, it's a much stronger right in the 1860s than it was in the 1790s. I can say that with any question. Uh, but only Justice Thomas went down that road. All right. Um, any other questions on Justice Stevens' dissent? I, it, it's a fairly small excerpt, but I think it gives a contrary history. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Wood, I didn't see you. Yeah. I just I wanted to bring up that you talked about storage laws. And yeah. I saw kind of like reiterations of that language in the, the lower courts yeah, that yeah. we were going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I just I found it interesting that he tried to use the storage laws for saying that it was somehow you know increases the argument the the weight of the argument that you can do this but in that time I think if you're looking at it through a historical lens the storage laws like they weren't really applied for the um, the fact that the government could do it, it was only because the way weapons were kept could degrade, and that went to your point earlier that Scalia was saying dangerous guns, like guns that were dangerous by their nature because they had degraded or ca could cause some harm that was not intended by their use. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't know if that was something that... Um, well, I, I think I get your question. Um, there were laws at the time, the framing, that prohibited the keeping of gunpowder in certain types of homes. Um, and the answer, reason why, should be obvious, fire, right? There's no fire force. You have gunpowder in like a wooden house. Uh, that's very dangerous. So Justice Breyer, in his dissent, said, well, there were always restrictions on where you could store your arms, which was a justification for the safe storage. Uh, and Scalia replied, those are laws about fire, not laws about 
uh, uh, bearing arms. Most guns today are fairly safe. I mean, safe as they go, uh, without being triggered. Uh, and most houses won't be burning up. But I think, yeah. But defining the contours of the right proved very problematic, which is why I think part three is there. It's like, we don't want to deal with this now. We'll deal with it later in 10 years. So Josh can be very angry for a decade. Yeah, I wrote a, what do I call the, the second class right or the, the, the orphan stepchild, the constitution, and all these various things. They've, the Supreme Court's just basically given up on the Second Amendment. Maybe next year they'll do a good job. All right, we'll see. I'm not, I'm not optimistic. All right, anything else in Stevens? Uh, Kelly, walk me through Justice Breyer. We talked a little bit about Justice Breyer, but g give me give me Breyer. Um, so do you agree with Stephen? Um, kind of, but not really. Uh, in the aspect that it's military related? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's no alternative um, equivalent to just the so that's <coughs> the only way to accomplish Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, we have here Peak Breyer. Um, again, Justice Breyer is a pragmatist of the highest order. And he looks at issues in a very pragmatic fashion. By the way, you think Justice Breyer would have a soft spot for guns. A couple of years ago, he was in a vacation home, some of the Caribbean. He was actually robbed at Machete Point. Um, someone broke into a, it was somewhere in the Caribbean, I just Googled this, I can't remember where it was, but someone broke into his house and with a machete and robbed him. Um, so he hasn't, hasn't budged on this issue. Uh, but he focused on the fact that the District of Columbia is a high crime, it's an urban area, guns or handguns are linked to urban deaths. And the burden is not disproportionate. Um, query for a second, should the fact that DC is an urban area with high crime make a difference? In other words, do constitutional rights mean different things in different places? In other words, does your right of free speech mean one thing in Provo, Utah, and another thing in you know, Las Vegas, Nevada? Uh, does the, does the, does the mm, mm, obscenity is one of the weird examples. Obscenity does look to local, local community decency standards. I wrote a long article saying that, 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 that that's inconsistent. Uh, does the Fourth Amendment, does the reasonableness of a search matter in one place or the other? Mm. Oh, yeah, the O'Brien, the draft card burning, yeah. Well, yeah, but... Oh, 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 World War I, I'm sorry, yeah. The World War I cases where, uh, because of the times that they were in, so I guess um, you can make that same argument here because of the circumstances they're in of, like, a highly populated... Mm. Mm. Yeah, Evan. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Andrew, what? I think that goes on more of the, the person who's holding the right, not the location where the right is. In other words, should the Second Amendment mean one thing in Montana, a different thing in Manhattan? Pryor seems to think so. Um, all right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Pryor says, normally you defer to the legislature's empirical judgments. Um, are there other measures that might promote the same goals while imposing less restrictions? Breyer says no. Uh, he says there may be less restrictive means, but there's nothing that's equivalent to an outright ban. So Breyer wouldn't even ask, is there some way they could accomplish a similar goal? Maybe by having a very strict licensing regime, they need to pack a background check or anything else. Breyer says no. Oh, Wit, your hand was up. I'm sorry. In times of law, the war is full. No, in times of war, the law is full of silent. That one? Yeah, we didn't talk about that. It's a, yeah, Colby. In regards to the First Amendment aspect, um, Breyer looks like he's wanting to regulate conduct in areas of suburban and how, do you, how people use guns, guns in suburban areas versus rural areas. Mm -hmm. and so conduct is regulated within the First Amendment in some aspects. So is he wanting to regulate conduct in the use of, in terms of the Second Amendment? 
uh, what do you mean by conduct? Like, you can say what you want to, like, uh, when you incite violence or say something in an area where um, you can incite violence or something of that nature, that, that type of conduct is regulated. So mm -hmm. in the aspect of, it's not the fact you possess the firearm, but it's how you use the firearm is what you want to do. Is how the gang is regulated. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that would be a bad idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Fair point. Uh, what else? All right. Anything else in Heller? Anything else in Heller? Well, again, Heller was 2008, June 2008. We don't have much guidance beyond then. Um, maybe when I teach this class again next year, it'll be a required class. Only people not want to be here. Uh, maybe I'll have something more profound to say. Uh, but that's it for Heller. Okay. Uh, anything else before we move on to the, the lower court cases? All right, let's do the first one. Uh, Ron Diesel, she's, she's a character. Uh, we actually asked her for permission to use her photograph in the book, and she said, I'll let you use my picture if you send me a free copy. So we, 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 we put her picture, and then we sent... I hope Randy did. I hope he sent her a copy of the book. Or at least we told. <laughs> shit, I gotta check. We 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 told we told her we'd send her a copy of the book. I hope we. I think we actually did. Oh man, I hope she's not mad at me. Uh, she's very nice though. Um, she's she's on Twitter like uh, at Mrs. Ezel or something something like that. She's very very active on Twitter. Okay. So after Heller McDonald was decided in 2010, or actually let's be more precise, uh, minutes after Heller was decided, um, Alan Gura who was my co-counsel in a few cases, um, uh, filed the lawsuit in Chicago. Chicago was the only other city in the country that actually had a handgun ban. And the only issue in McDonald was, is the Second Amendment incorporated? Does it apply to the states? Um, Alan Gura argued that it should be extended to the states with the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. Correct. The NRA basically butted into the case and said, no, 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 don't do this PRI stuff. Just go for the Due Process Clause. Uh, Paul Clement, the same guy in Mc Heller who argued for Bush to intermediate scrutiny, he jumped in and said due process. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled, agree with the NRA, and used due process. They did not use PRI. Uh, I think that was the day I revoked my NRA membership a long time ago. Uh, I was like, forget this. Um, or maybe decide not to renew it at least. Um, in any event, after McDonald, uh, the Chicago, Chicago handgun ban fell. Uh, then Chicago enacted a series of new gun control laws, uh, the most insane of which is this. They say, to have a gun license, you need to have one hour of firearm training, but we will ban all shooting ranges in the city. <laughs> uh, right? All right, uh, JC, walk, walk me through Judge Sykes' opinion in Ezel versus Chicago. Basically, he... She, oh, she. she. Yeah, uh, Diane Sykes. Very good judge. He was actually on Trump's shortlist, and the day after Justice Scalia died, or the day Scalia died, uh, there was a debate, a presidential debate, and um, uh, Trump said, I would appoint either Diane Sykes or Bill Pryor, who's a judge in Alabama at the Supreme Court. Uh, neither of them made it to the final go, uh, but both very good judges. All right, JC. Uh, so she basically Thank you. pointed out, like you've been saying, we don't have a lot to go on here. Uh, that, okay, we've got Heller, and now we've got McDonald, so. Yeah, she cites me, you know she's in trouble. In that, that? in that big footnote. Oh, there you are. Yeah, look at that. You know she's in trouble when she's citing me. Hey, go on. Sorry. Ding. But anyway, so, yeah. uh, so start talking about uh, basically where the rubber met the road was applying the framework from the previous cases to mm -hmm. the gun ban and said, okay, I see what you did here. I don't buy it. They kind of try to do the runaround thing. They're like, well, okay, we're not going to have the gun laws. We're just going to tell you you can't get the firearm license because we're going to remove the ranges. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, she said there has to be some kind of scrutiny and there has to be some kind of purpose behind the law. And they hadn't proved that they actually had a solid purpose up to this point. Okay, very good. Thank you, JC. Um, so, again, this is, I think, what, 2010 or 2011? Yeah, funny story. She actually cited me and spelled my name wrong. Uh, she wrote Blackman, M-U-N, and I flipped out and I sent an email, uh, and she got it and she apologized and they fixed it. Uh, so now that's why it's correct. Um, as long as they spell your name right. Um, so first she says, 
Uh, we're not going to apply rational basis. We're not going to give this law a deferential presumption of constitutionality. This is, again, footnote four. The city has the burden to justify their actions under heightened review. She's not quite committing what exactly that is. Uh, they will not import the undue burden standard from the abortion cases. That's Planned Parenthood against Casey. She says, instead, we'll look to the First Amendment. She says, the applicable standard of review depends on the nature and degree of the governmental burden in the First Amendment. The nature of the burden doesn't sound like Breyer. Was Breyer like this? How the burden? I mean, again, I think Breyer is underrated. He, he says what everyone else is thinking, right? Everyone else sort of covers their analysis with these fancy words. Breyer's like, screw it. Balance it, right? Just balance it. But when you have Diane Sykes balancing, it comes a little bit different than, than, than C.B. Breyer. So first you ask, a severe burden on the core Second Amendment right of armed self-defense will require an extremely strong public interest justification and a close fit between the means and the ends. So we have this concept of the core Second Amendment right. Uh, who's next? Cameron. What are they talking about a core? What, what's, what's that? What are they getting at core? Um, you're talking about like core. Yeah, they use this word the core. They use this in a few different spots. What's core? I was thinking of probably like those original ones. Just the what does core remind you of? Or let me ask you this question. What would you call a right that's outside the core? <laughs> you know what I'm thinking of. Lord help us, penumbra. <laughs> Lord help us, right? You have the core of the right, then you have the penumbral right. We had, God, we did Caroline products and Griswold on the same day. Again, I, I don't like this concept of the core of the right, uh, but the court seems to gravitate to it, saying, well, is this really in the center of the right, or is this a right like, you know, floating around? You know, for example, uh, you, the right to keep a gun that's in the core, maybe the right to carry the guns, that's a little bit further away, and then the right to go target shooting is a little bit like here, and maybe the right to buy a guns like here, or maybe the right to buy a guns here. Right? How do you um, locate a right in these various? You remember chemistry? You have the nucleus, right, and all the different rings of electrons around it, right? Which ring are you in uh, uh, around the penumbral, whatever? Okay. So Sykes first asks, "Are you within the core of the Second Amendment?" Okay. Then she says. If you're closer to the margins, that is, you're more penumbral, right? You don't need as much of a burden. Uh, sorry, you don't need as much of a justification, right? In other words, as you get further from the core, the government needs less of a justification, right? Which is basically the Breyer balancing test on stilts, I guess. You're sort of balancing it, but depending how close you are, you get higher or lower. Uh, I'm not even sure how that works. Uh, but this case, I think, is really easy, right? I mean, putting aside all scrutiny, the city says you need one hour of shooting, and then they go ahead and ban all the places where you can do target practice. I mean, come on. That's like, that, that's really easy to say this is a stupid law. And the city said, well, they can go take a bus to some other place in Illinois, or maybe they can go to Wisconsin or something. But if you're a resident of a city, and you want to exercise a right in the city, and the city says to do this, you have to have a one hour of training. They say, but you can't get this train anywhere in the city. Uh, I think this was an easy case. Um, you know, Alan Gurr, the lawyer who litigated this case, I think at the time he tweeted a picture of a check from Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, paying his fees. Uh, this, this, this was an easy one. But then at the end, Judge Sykes says, the city must demonstrate that civilian target practice at a firing range creates such genuine and serious risk to public safety that prohibiting range training throughout the city is justified. In other words, if there's a risk of having gun ranges near civilian areas, you can put them in industrial parks, right? Make them far away from everything else. By the way, I used to live um, uh, uh, across the street from a firing range. Uh, uh, it was on Westheimer. And the firing range was right next to a polling precinct. So when you would go vote, you'd hear pew, pew, pew. Uh, <laughs> it freaked people out. OK. What was that? Oh, don't even. I'll get in trouble for that one. OK. All right, so any question on Judge Sykes and Ezel? Right. I think it's a good opinion. I think it, this illustrates how scrutiny can work. 
Um, the next opinion is no longer good law. Uh, when this went to print, we had this little note saying that the Court of Appeals had grant, granted rehearing on Bonk. Guess what? They reversed. Uh, so Judge O'Scanlan's opinion is no longer good law, but I think it just gives you a, it gives you a sense of how courts can apply Second Amendment scrutiny in a different way. Okay, so this is a similar <laughs> situation, right? Um, the city of Al or Alameda County uh, said you can only sell a gun within 500 feet of a residentially zoned district. I'm sorry, you can't sell a gun near a school, a daycare center, a firearm sales business, a liquor store, or anywhere liquor serve, which is basically a restaurant of any sort. Um, I know the guys who litigate this case as well. They conducted a very thorough uh, 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 study of the area, and they found that there was basically nowhere in the city where you could build a store, right? If you draw a 500 foot radius around every one of these properties, there's nowhere. And then I think at one point they actually found the place that was like within the radius. And they said, oh no, but we'll measure it from this door instead of that door, so now you're within the sweep. So the city made it impossible to actually have a store to sell guns. Now this raises the question, does the right to bear arms include the right to acquire arms? Maybe you can just go to a different county to buy the gun, right? Okay. So let's walk through, uh, 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 Gerald, uh, walk through um, uh, Justice O'Scanlan's opinion. He has a two-step, a two-step process in uh, to share. Right. So we'll talk about the first step being determine whether the Okay. Let me pause you there for a minute. Right. So he's not asking about the core of the right. Right. He's not saying how far you're from the center. Judge O'Scanlan, who's actually based in Portland, a very, very prominent appellate judge, uh, Judge O'Scanlan says, is there a historical basis for this, right? Um, is there historically a right to acquire arms? And I think the answer obviously is yes, right? In order to have a gun, you have to get it from somewhere. Um, judge Kavanaugh, who's now Justice Kavanaugh, had a very similar approach in a case called Heller II. Was it Heller III? I can never remember. I think it was Heller II. Okay. And O'Scanlan writes, if the right to keep and bear arms has any force, and people must have a right to acquire the very firearms they're entitled to keep and bear. Okay. Now, Gerard, what, what's the second step? Uh, the next step in the is to identify the proper standard of review. Okay. Here, it's, again, it sort of goes off the rails, right? It's always, it's always very tricky. Uh, Heller, in that footnote, remember the one I read to you verbatim, specifically said that we don't cast doubt on laws imposing conditions on the sale of firearms. So Heller identified as a presumptively lawful thing laws on the conditions of firearms. Okay, does that mean that the county wins? Judge says no. Uh, that doesn't mean that all sales, all selling rules are immune. If that were the case, then the city could just ban the sale of firearms. And what good is having a gun if you can't acquire it? I suppose if you already have it, you're good, but if you don't have it, you're screwed. And they say that the county has failed to meet its burden, right? You can't have a categorical ban on acquiring it. Therefore, we have heightened scrutiny, more than rational basis. Okay. Uh, the court assumes that intermediate scrutiny applies, and the county fails to satisfy its burden. Um, there's no evidence that having uh, a, a gun store operates as like a magnet for crime. We can't accept the government's assertions at face value. Okay. Any questions on the, on the circuit opinion? Uh, uh, surprise, surprise, the Ninth Circuit reversed um, on Bonk, and they said that uh, you know we are not going to uh, second guess the decisions of the elected branches. So again, who has the burden? Is the burden on the individual, or is the burden on the uh, government? And the Ninth Circuit on Bonk more or less said that the government met, met whatever burden that existed. OK. Any questions on to share? Again, that's no longer a good law, but it's useful to study. Dana, let's talk about Jackson versus San Francisco by Judge Okuda. By the way, uh, there's actually a blog about the Ninth Circuit and Judge Okuda. It's called the Okuda Matata blog. I love it. She's very nice, by the way. I, I actually met her a few months ago. She's very, very, very nice. Don't like this opinion. All right, Dana, go ahead. 
Jesse? Okay. Okay, does the court think that this is a severe burden? Um, or the Ninth Circuit, at least. No, they don't think it's substantial. Why is it not a substantial burden? Yeah. So Judge Okuda um, writes that this burden is indirect, right? Um, yes, it might add some more time to take the trigger lock off, but you can still do it uh, with a minimal burden. Again, I, you don't have to have a gun, but just get like a combination lock and try to put on your nightstand, turn the light off, and try and undo it. Uh, I can't. I, I can't even do it with my, with, with my eyes open. I always futz with the front door. Um, let me just pause the note here. Um, there are some so-called smart guns where you have to use your fingerprint to unlock it. Um, how many of you use your fingerprint to unlock your smartphone? Most of you. How many times you like jammed a few times it doesn't work right away? Yeah. So you know you can actually swipe up to take a picture quickly? Apple figured out when time really counts, you can avoid the fingerprint. Uh, you, know, you swipe up, get your picture out. But th those sorts of fingerprint readers are not reliable enough, um, I think, for any meaningful use. Okay. Uh, also, California law says that you can keep the person on, so you can keep the gun on your person. So in other words, in theory at least, when you're home, you can carry it around with you at all times. So that way you don't have to have it keep it locked. Uh, I don't know if that works when you're sleeping. I think the blind man and the sleeping person like can't uh, keep a loaded gun on their, on their hip. I think that'd be a very bad idea. Ultimately, they say that San Francisco carried its burden, and they demonstrated that the locked storage law serves a significant government interest by reducing the number of gun-related injuries and deaths. Okay. The law is upheld. So any questions in the circuit opinion? Okay. So now we go on appeal to the Supreme Court. Jackson versus San Francisco. Uh, Jessica, you want to walk me through Justice Thomas's dissent from the denial of certiorari. And this is actually called a dissental, right? Dissent from denial of certiorari, it's abbreviated as dissental. You learned a new word today. Okay, go ahead, Jessica. Um, I just have that he goes on to talk about self-defense, and it is this case that the whole reason why we have the Second Amendment, and that's the central point of that, so that should be, um, I guess, taken away. Very good. Okay, so Justice Thomas, first off, he is dissenting from what? He's dissenting from his colleague's decision not to grant certiorari. Again, He's there with Scalia, which means that there are two. You need four votes for certiorari. So that means Kennedy, Stevens, I'm sorry, Kennedy, Roberts, and Alito from the Heller majority aren't going with him. Which are the two that don't want to take the case? Eh, we don't know, right? But they didn't go along with him. Um, Alito, I think even Alito's a little squishy because he was a longtime prosecutor from New Jersey. I don't think he has a strong affinity for guns either. Um, but yeah, we'll find out. See, see, see where the rubber meets the road. I think Judge Kavanaugh will be solid on this one. Uh, he, he was very vigorous in the Second Amendment as a circuit court judge. Uh, but we'll, and Gorsuch, too, has already had a good dissent, but we'll, we'll see where they are. I don't know. Okay. Justice Thomas then writes that this law burdens the right to self-defense at the time people are most vulnerable, when they're sleeping, bathing, changing clothes, or otherwise indisposed. Uh, he gives the, an uh, uh, the anecdote about the elderly woman who puts her gun in a lockbox, she needs to turn on the light, find her glasses, find the keys, insert the key, unlock the box, load the gun, and then get in position. And that can take um, some time. Then he writes, the court's refusal to review this decision is difficult to account for in light of its repeated willingness to review spitless decisions involving alleged violations of other constitutional rights. Uh, what's he talking about there? Abortion. Right? Spitless rights. Uh, spitless decisions. Basically, decisions based on, uh, made up on countless, uh, count, you know, bleh. decisions based on made up rights in the Constitution. So Thomas is pretty, pretty pissed here. Okay. So any other questions on the, on the San Francisco case? All right, Kyle, you want to do the uh, Friedman versus Highland Park? It's a case out of Chicago uh, by Judge Easterbrook.
Yeah, that, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, so first off, this case involves what might be called an assault rifle. Um, it's a term that's designed to scare people. It has no actual meaning. Um, basic tutorial. There's a little diagram I had added to the book which explains it. But with most guns, when you pull the trigger once, one bullet comes out. That's what's called semi-automatic, right? You pull the trigger once and one bullet comes out. Um, the definition of automatic is when you hold the trigger, it sprays, right? Rapid fire, one after the other. <clears throat> an assault rifle is not an automatic weapon. Uh, the phrase assault rifle means cosmetic features. For example, does the magazine detach? Is there a handle, a pistol grip in the front? Does it have a shoulder stocking leaning against your shoulder? Uh, my favorite, does it have a bayonet lug? Who the hell is a bayonet thing? But you know, you can put a little screw in there for it to have a bayonet. Does it have an RPG launcher, right? You can actually get an AR-15 with an RPG launcher accessory. Why the hell you want that? I don't know. But I suppose you can have that. Um, I won't ask anyone has one of those, <laughs> right? You can't get it like explosive ordinances. You can get the holder. You get the mount. Uh, so the entire idea of an, a of an assault rifle is, is basically a misnomer. It's designed to scare people. If you take out all those cosmetic features, the gun is just as powerful. Uh, it might be harder to reload, although there are ways around that. But it's, it's primarily a, it's cosmetic, and I, I don't know the way to say it. Um, Highland Park banned uh, these so-called assault, um, uh, 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 assault weapons, right? And they also banned large capacity magazines, which means more than 10. Um, bullets are stored in these little box called a magazine. You fire drop them out, put them back in. Um, I suppose having to reload does slow down the process a little bit, although people can reload pretty pretty quick. Yeah, Noel? This might be a little bit off, but so is, is that assault rifle term one that NRA actually uses? No. Or have they taken ownership and used a software name? No. This was a term made up by gun control advocates, right? In the 1980s, okay, so this group talk, called the Brady Campaign, Right? Who's Brady? He was Reagan's press secretary. The original name of this group was basically the, the Brady Center for Handgun Control or Handgun something, whatever, right? And the original goal is to ban handguns. They realized that wasn't going to work. So they moved on to bigger, scarier guns like assault weapons. And they basically made up this name. It doesn't have any actual relevance to the power of a gun, right? It just it describes cosmetic features on the gun. Uh, so the NRA doesn't use it. I never use this phrase. How do they refer to the so model the gun, an AR 15, or whatever the model is. Again, AR does not mean assault rifle. It means Armalite. It's a, it's a brand. It's like Coca-Cola. Isn't that just like a tactical rifle is what they're talking about? What do you mean tactical? I don't know. Military-looking <laughs> rifle? Looking, exactly. It's cosmetic. <laughs> it looks scary. Right? The gun control movement, they say, we have these scary-looking guns with these big bells and whistles. We'll ban them. Yeah. yeah. The most significant one is that you can't, re you can't pop out the magazine and, and, and limit the size of the magazine. It actually does have an impact. Yeah. I'm sorry? The high capacity magazine? That guy was overturned. Now it's being challenged again. Uh, what do you mean overturned? So uh, that the, the California ban high capacity magazine is over 10 rounds. Mm. Um, oh, that's going to be reversed on Bonk. Don't worry. No, it already, it already did. It got reversed, and then, um, and then so now they're challenging it again. But no. right now in California, you can't buy it. I'll check that later. Okay. Um, it won't go very far. The Supreme Court has not taken any of the, uh, of the, of the uh, high capacity magazine cases. Um, th there are so many ways around these laws, it, it's actually silly. I'll just give you an example. One of them, California's a law saying that you can't have what's called a detachable magazine. That, e that means usually if you have a magazine and a gun, you push a button and the magazine drops out. So it makes it quick to reload. They said you need to use a tool to remove the magazine. So a guy I know invented it was called a bullet button, which basically means you push a button, take a bullet, you push the little button, things pops out. So you just put that in your keychain, it pops out right back in. So it, it does <laughs> these things are, these things aren't very effective uh, uh, at all. Okay. All right. So Easterbrook writes his opinion, and Heller, as you recall, this was Kyle's question. Heller did not say that the only sorts of weapons that you can have are those uh, you can use in the militia. Right? Heller didn't say that. Beesberg says, I don't care. I'm a life tenure judge. Um, 
We think it better to ask whether regulation bans weapons that were common at the time of ratification, that's not the test, or those that have some reasonable relationship to the preservation of a well-regulated militia, that's not the test, and whether law-abiding citizens retain adequate means of self-defense, that's not the test. So this is Eastbrook basically saying, I don't like Keller, go ahead and reverse me. I dare you. And what did the Supreme Court do? Uh, they denied review. They denied cert. In fact, he actually cites McCulloch v. Maryland in the last part, right? McCulloch, that we have to look to democracy, not to the courts, um, to, 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 to develop constitutional law. Again, Easterbrook has a number of these opinions uh, in which he basically is an open insurrection against Heller. Yeah, Colby, then what? Yeah, what? Doesn't, I, I don't know, to me, I, I thought that that was just saying it's a political question. Like, That's exactly what he's saying. I mean, I think I like the way you phrase it, Wit. It's basically saying it's a question for the political process, not for the courts, which is another way of saying rational basis review. So long as there's some rational basis, it's not for us to intervene. Right? It's not quite saying there's zero for the courts. He says, as long as you have some alternate means of self-defense, we're not going to intervene. So you can have a handgun but not a rifle. Okay, that's good. But anything beyond that is a political question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and Eastbrook had a couple of these sorts of opinions uh, on the on the Seventh Circuit. He's very, he's he's viewed as a conservative judge. He was a Reagan nominee, very smart guy. But uh, on this issue, he's he's pretty. I think it's his mind made up. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I think ah yeah, wait, I think you're next. Okay, so let's talk about then Friedman versus Highland Park, 2015 Supreme Court. Once again, Justice Thomas dissents with his buddy Scalia. Walk me through the, uh, the Thomas analysis. Um, so he essentially says, or the last case where he says, granted cert on this, he says these regulations go too far. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he specifically, like the high or lower capacity magazines, um, is used to refer to all ammunition feeding devices that accept more than 10. Mm -hmm. And so the regulations in this sense were um, went beyond the decision of Heller because they were uh, weapons commonly found for lawful lawful purposes uh, by law to provide service. Okay, very good. Thank you, Wit. Uh, Thomas basically says this disregards Heller in three regards. Um, first, Heller was not limited to the weapons that were bearable arms in 1791. It exists, extends to weapons that are in existence now, right? Second, the Second Amendment gives rights to individuals, not state governments. Uh, it was wrong to give these localities this power, Thomas writes. Uh, again, this is a city law and not a state law. So even assuming that Heller is a right that states can exercise, uh, it doesn't work for cities. And third, right, Heller asked whether a law bans weapons commonly used for lawful purpose. It doesn't matter if the public feels safer. He says if a, if a ban based on a conjecture that the public might feel safer, the Second Amendment guarantees nothing. And again, at the end, Thomas rebukes the court for not intervening. Again, this was almost four years ago. Scalia's gone now, right? So this keeps going on. You don't study lower court decisions, but most law is made up in the lower courts. The Supreme Court takes very few cases, maybe 70 or 80 a year. So in the absence of the Supreme Court review, the lower courts have sort of went on their own with this, this area. All right, any questions on the Highland Park case? OK. All right, last case is Peruta versus San Diego, another case from California, about the right to uh, carry a handgun. Uh, Colby, you want to walk us through the facts here? A member of the what? Of the general public. Oh, the general public. I heard I, I heard a pigeon republic. Oh, no. <laughs> pigeon republic. Uh, nickname for California. A, a, uh, weapon in the public has he or she is issue a license. 
Okay, and how do you get a license? Um, you, must, you must satisfy a number of conditions, and one of those conditions is show good cause to consider it uh, a concealed firearm. Okay, and what's good cause? Well, if California law authorizes county sheriffs to establish pol public or in public policy to find good cause. Okay, and how does the San Diego sheriff find good cause? Um, as requiring a particular reason why an applicant needs a concealed firearm for self defense. Okay, is it enough to say that I need, I need, I need a gun for self defense? No, no, that's not what I asked. No. Is it enough? Okay. So, nationwide, there are two standards for handgun licenses, right? What's called shall issue and what's called may issue. Okay? Texas is a shall issue state. What does that mean? So long as you meet the requisite background check, you have no criminal history, et cetera, they shall issue a license. There's no discretion, right? If you're not a criminal and you have the, you put your fingerprints and whatever other paperwork you need to submit, you get it. Was it? I don't think you do anymore. Yeah, I think that was, that was limited a couple of years ago. I sucker, I took it. I think Texas eliminated the written test. That's not to buy one, that's just. To carry a gun outside the home. Oh my goodness, yes. To, to buy a gun, you don't need anything. But, but to carry outside the home, right? And, and, and fun fact, if you ever go to the Texas Capitol and you have a concealed handgun license, you can skip the security lines because you can carry in the Capitol. I once went for an investiture of a justice and Scalia was there and I just, I breezed past security. I took mine in 2012 or 13. Uh, I think a couple of years, I think they phased out the written test. Just like three or four years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not anyway, so that's shall issue. Um, I got renew mine. Thank you for reminding me of my, my Utah one. Um, May issue is there's discretion, right? They can decide whether you really need the license. And I think Colby said it correctly. It's, it's completely discretionary standard. In other words, that the local sheriffs can decide whatever they want. Um, it's not enough to say you have a need for self-defense. You have to show a particularized need, that you have something special above and beyond the average citizen. And let me tell you, these are granted mostly to friends and family. If you are an influential person, you will get your permit. If you're not, you will not get your permit. It's completely arbitrary. Celebrities will get it, right? Influential people will get it. But if you're a poor Joe who wants to defend himself, you're not going to get it. It's completely arbitrary. Okay. So this scheme was challenged in San Francisco, oh, sorry, San Diego. The Ninth Circuit held the Second Amendment does not protect the right of the members to carry a general, uh, uh, members of the general public to carry a concealed gun in, in, in public. Right? So the majority says the right to keep bear arms is limited only to the home. Heller said in the home, that's it, we'll not go beyond that. Uh, there was a concurrence by Judge Graber who said that even if we assume it applies outside the home, the good cause standard is a permissible balance right, to prevent guns from proliferating on the street. All right. Uh, Joseph, uh, let's, let's bring it home. Walking through Peruta, California, Justice Thomas, now joined by Justice Gorsuch after the passing of Justice Scalia. It's one of Gorsuch's first opinions, I think. Um, I was like, yeah, go Gorsuch. Uh, so Thomas started out by uh, the good cause requirement. Yeah. Very good. Okay, thank you, Joseph. So uh, Justice Thomas makes a few different points. So first he says that the good cause standard is completely arbitrary, that it vests too much discretion in the hands of government officials 
about whether you can exercise your right. Um, second, he says that the phrase bear arms has a, a meaning about wearing arms. Uh, he says it's extremely improbable that the framers understood their Second Amendment to protect little more than carrying a gun from the bedroom to the kitchen, right? They can just keep the gun in the house. And there are lots of other cases. Now, um, back in the day, um, the problem was actually uh, open carrying, right? There, there were bands of open carrying, although people perhaps were allowed to conceal carry. Um, Self-defense is not limited to the home, and it's taken to whoever a person has to be. Okay. And then Thomas again opens up and rebukes the Supreme Court. The time has come for the court to answer these questions. I do not see much value in waiting for additional courts to weigh in when constitutional rights are at stake. This case reflects a distressing trend, the treatment of the Second Amendment as a disfavored right. We've had 35 First Amendment cases in the last decade, we have 25 Fourth Amendment cases and zero argued Second Amendment cases. He says this discrepancy is inexcusable. The answer is closed. I, I like this quote. Let me read it. He says, for those of us who work in marble halls, guarded constantly by a vigilant and dedicated police force, the guarantees of the Second Amendment might seem antiquated and superfluous. <clears throat> Breyer. Right, he's, just, he's, he's talking about Breyer right here, I think. Maybe Roberts, I don't know. Roberts is from Maryland, it's not, you know, the other side. But the framers made a clear choice. He's, he's actually from Indiana, but he's been in Maryland for a while. The framers made a clear choice. They reserved to all Americans the right to bear arms for self-defense. I do not think we should stand by idly while a state denies its citizens that right, particularly when their very lives may depend on it. I respectfully dissent. And we will find out, I hope next year, some more about the Second Amendment. Anything else? Thank you all for a wonderful semester. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, based on everything we talked about today.